Um, so now, not really changing gears, but want to talk about how the various challenges that we're going to see throughout this course really stem from the, the change that digital brought, that interactive brought, that is best, in my view, expressed through video games, and how any new mass medium will start on the periphery and move towards the center and the legal process and the legal consequences of that happening. So there's a pretty magical paper which uh, is referred to in your materials later on, and we'll talk about it in greater detail later on. Um, but it's written by Bruce Boyden of Marquette University Law School. It's called Games and Other Uncopyrightable Systems. And it's not about video games. It's about games games. And it is about how systems are not copyrightable. And that's why card games are not copyrightable. That's why other forms of games are not don't attract intellectual property protection. It's, in a sense, why Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's uh, Abdul Skyhook was not capable of attracting intellectual property protection, though he tried. Yes, he tried. Google it. It's there. Um, there were various reasons, as you will learn as you go through the course in your own thinking, there are various reasons why things don't attract intellectual property protection. And pure systems is part of it, pure lists. Uh, so a recipe is a list of ingredients. Um, you will see um, in your materials a, a, a reference to a a piece on fashion and fashion law and why fashion, um, other than trademark, doesn't attract intellectual property protection because it's utilitarian. And it's important to use that backdrop when you look at video games. And I couldn't more strongly refer you to a paper than, than to Boyden. He concludes that games are not copyrightable and shouldn't be copyrightable. And he talks at length, I'm not going to get into it here because we'll talk about it more in another class, about the interactive elements of games. I just want to plant that seed because we're going to go to some cases. But there's an implication, and that is games, if games, if you accept that games are not copyrightable, if you accept that games do not attract intellectual property protection, and we all know that video games do attract intellectual property protection, how did that happen? Well, wouldn't you have some elements of games being really good grounds for copyright? I mean, like, if I'm doing like a first-person shooter, like a Halo game, yeah. obviously the fact that I'm a first-person shooter, that's something that usually costs games that might be system. But if you actually take the narrative and the characters and the surroundings and maybe even some of the art that's happening in the video game, wouldn't those all be the sort of things that tends to be covered under copyright? Well, exactly. And, and Boyden's quote is, the constituent elements might attract copyright, but the overall system doesn't, 
And yes, that's exactly what we're going to explore. Please. Yeah, I mean, isn't what we were talking about earlier with fixation? Like, you can't fix a poker game. Uh, not in that sense, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, a video game is code and images on a disk. It's yeah. fixed, or a hard drive, or well, something else. Where you do that. And, and, and that's the question. Video games are code on a disk. They are, so, but can you fix a massively multiplayer game of Halo? Every game you play is different. Even actually, non-multiplayer games and non-massive games, every game of Grand Prix Legends that I ever played as a single player against the AI was different from every other game because of the level of complexity. I never got the exact same time on the Nurburgring in my Lotus as any other time. Well, what about, I mean, like a choose your own adventure novel? You could read it a hundred different ways and it's still, you know, there's a certain number of possibilities, even if it's an infinitely different scale for a video game. There's still only, you know, a certain number of possibilities. Well, it's still I, a closed system. Well, and, and that, but, yeah, and that becomes the core question. Is it, a closed, is it a closed system or isn't it? I'm not saying you're wrong. In fact, the courts have said you're right. Our job is to figure out why you're right and whether there may be something wrong with the fact that you're right. But th that is exactly the, the point. Is it a finite piece or has something changed? because games are so massive and no result is the same as any other result. The legal answers have been pretty simple. It's for you to decide whether they're too simple or not. Any other questions on this point? Okay, so if you accept that games, not video games, but if you accept that games are not copyrightable, then the obvious things that would make video games attract intellectual property protection is that they are like movies, like TV. They are art. And that, for a bunch of reasons, seems like a very appealing proposition. especially if you have to fight for it. Do you think this is art? It's a nice rainbow. Okay. I've seen a lot less detailed modern art pieces. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you have seen a lot less detailed modern art pieces. That is art. There is no doubt that is art. I framed it to it on my wall. Yep. Many have. <laughs> okay. Not everybody thought that was art. In your materials, and all over your materials, you will find the case of Atari versus Oman. Oman was the Register of Copyright of the United States of America. Atari applied for a copyright on Breakout, the game I just showed you. Breakout is, in video gaming terms, in the late 80s. Remember, this is Court of Appeal case, so it takes a while to get there. Breakout's a pretty simple game. The Register of Copyright refused copyright on the game, not once, but twice. You can read the case, you'll see, he said, this is just a bunch of circles and dots. There is <coughs> these are all familiar shapes <coughs> and sizes and colors and geometries and is therefore not susceptible 
to intellectual property protection. It does not attract intellectual property protection. U.S. Court of Appeal said, of course it does. I'll get to the reasoning in a minute. Zohar. Um, well, I just, I've kind of been thinking this now for the last five minutes, so it's probably related to a bunch of that stuff. But uh, it seems that, you know, if that was painted, okay, that picture that we saw of a, a breakout was painted, then the copyright would come because of, you know, the painting, the painter, okay, art from that direction. But in this case, it's code that was written that made that. So the fact that you showed us a picture and we were asked whether or not that seems like art, I think is a little bit misleading in the sense that it's, a, it's about the code. It's like it, there's copyright in written work, literary work now includes copy, uh, software, code. Mm -hmm. That's where the copyright stems from in my mind. Okay, well, the, the, the argument that you've made is it's code. Code itself, per se, is not copyrightable. You, you, you know that. But the digital, you look to the digital origins, not to the art. Um, that is, we will see in the next case we talk about, um, we'll see that that is a factor. In Oman, the issue that the court was faced with is that the threshold for getting copyright protection is very low. And yet you had a register of copyright who refused to register this. And they did look at it in artistic terms. And the key point, which is rather buried in the case, it's, it's kind of in a footnote, um, was a question that the district court, the lower court, asked the register of copyright. And that question, which is a brilliant one, if Picasso, so remember the, 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 the problem the register of copyright had is that these are just simple shapes, simple sounds, there's nothing special here. And the district court judge said, if Picasso had painted a round object on a canvas, would you say because it depicts a familiar subject, namely something that's round, it can't be copyrighted? If Picasso had made <coughs> breakout, would it be art? And the register of copyright said yes, it would be copyrighted. At that point, obviously, the case is lost. And breakout, as it should, qualified as art, qualified for copyright protection, and on we go. But art isn't necessarily qualifying as copyright. No, nope. it's an expression, and what you have sort of elided here is the, you know, the idea expression uh, dichotomy, dichotomy mm -hmm. which in Baker and Selden is essentially just colored bars, and basically it was denied there, still is denied under U.S. copyright law and under most international. There are limitations. There must be expression, and even when the copyright is given, I realize this is video game sort of, sort of uh, uh, precedents you're talking about, but 60 years from now, or 100 years, it'll be 90 now, I suppose, um, that material, those designs, will enter into what's called public domain. They become the public general property, intellectual property. And you've also been aligning notions of copyright with notions of trademark, of notions of, of some of the other IP sorts of regimes, which have very different kinds of hurdles to get over. So one has to be a little bit careful here um, in terms of talking about the distinction. When, you know, I mean, you can say your, your, your point is, is, is well taken, this is code. But then again, what's a painter's medium of expression? It's different types of paints, it's different types of brushes, it's different types of applications. All of those are considered to be the tools of every artist. They can be used 
by every artist. And they are expressly not copyrightable, not something that you can lock away as being only available to yourself. Unlike patent, where you can patent formula and a variety of things like that. So there's some very important distinctions in IP right, in law that have to be made. And, and the core, if I can paraphrase, is that the constituent elements are not do not necessarily, do not attract, and should not attract. It's like the games, in not the video game sense, but in the game sense, intellectual property protection. The paintbrush doesn't do it. The keyboard doesn't do it. You, you may code, you may create a game on your Mac. Apple doesn't have any rights over your game. The tool itself and the tools itself don't attract IP protection. And as we'll learn in the course of, the, in, in, in the course of our time together, genres of games don't attract protection. So the point that's, that, that, that's being made is actually critical to where I want to take this. Because on its surface, Atari, Atari and Oman is to us gamers can be read as a case of prejudice. It can be read as a register of copyright who didn't want to acknowledge that gaming, that video gaming was a medium. And that raises certain hackles to us gamers because we want legitimacy. <coughs> and we do believe it's art. But there's something misleading, as Ken points out. We mislead ourselves. And I'm going to take you through some of the ironies of what happens as much as we as gamers go, we want that legitimacy. What happens? when you say games attract, video games attract copyright, intellectual property. So, well, as soon as you attract IP, you attract the limitations of IP law. You attract, well, you got to have an author. It belongs to, or seems to belong to, someone. Modifying it is a risk. Not something you should be doing without permission. You bring this whole quasi-ownership structure to bear on the area. And if you look at that not from the perspective of the US Court of Appeal in 1994, but in, from your perspective as digital citizens in 2013, you might look at some of those costs very differently. And over the next 11 weeks, we'll be talking a lot about that. But let's go to the core of the interactive question that was asked earlier. Case in your material, Stern versus Kaufman. Much earlier case than Atari versus Oman. 1982, US Court of Appeal. Try and cast your minds back to the time before you were born. How's that for an existential conundrum? And imagine that the US Court of Appeal would be, it is pretty safe to say, in 1982, would be constituted of pretty well non-video game players. I don't have absolute proof of that. And you have a case about a successful game called Scramble, and a total ripoff of that game.
These are console games. So the software and the hardware are embedded within each other. Somebody just knocked off Scramble. Scramble was doing well in the arcades. And there was a Scramble knockoff. And there was a lawsuit. And the defendants, as you might expect, threw every argument but the kitchen sink, <laughs> and sometimes including the, the kitchen sink on the table, to try and argue that the originators of Scramble should not succeed because there was no intellectual property protection to Scramble. So they threw in a ton of arguments. The argument we're focusing on is that each game is different from every other game because of the player's participation and therefore doesn't attract intellectual property protection. There's no fixation, the argument. Never gets fixed. Every game is different from every other game because of interactivity. The nub of the problem. But remember when we are before you're born. Court said, no. Of course there's protection. This was, I think, the point you raised. Andrew? Someone first conceived what the audiovisual display would look like. There was a concept here. Somebody envisioned it. There's only limited permutations. It's just a branching tree structure. It's like a script. Script's protectable. This must be protectable. And here's the quote. Someone first conceived what the audiovisual display would look like and sound like originality occurred at that point. NIP protection occurred at that point. What could be simpler? To a judge in 1982 on the US Court of Appeal who almost certainly was not a gamer. In legal terms, it's pretty easy. So it's not for me to answer this question. It's for you to answer this question. What does massively multiplayer technology, what does endless open world technology, what does crowdsourced modding and creating and tools do to all of this? And does it, most importantly, make you feel a little queasy about the result in Atari and Oman? That's the core conundrum. Reactions, questions, puzzles. OK. One possible comment. If you were to look at, the, at, at that very question about a modified game. In other words, you've got an original original product that you've made. And someone else comes along, another inventor, and they make a product which improves upon your own, the modification. Under patent law, if you're patenting your invention, which is for a much shorter period of time, by the way, for that person to be able to exploit their innovation on your original invention, they would have to get a license from you. And for you, now that you're aware of their innovation, to include that in your next 2.0 version or 3.0 version, whatever it is, of that game, you would have to license with them. 
for permission of theirs. They could get a patent, but they could not exploit it economically if you had the first patent until your patent ran out without those licenses. That's a different IP regime, but that would be one different approach to something like the copyright issue that's here. Thanks, Kevin. Second irony in the be careful what you wish for category. We want respect. We are gamers. We were pushed to the periphery. We had, you know, the original gaming, the original games were, you know, sold in baggies, you know, and, and it wasn't that they were black marketed, it was that they were way, way on the periphery and they were done by people outside the artistic community. The artistic community has now gravitated and invented gaming and has produced endlessly bad movies on gaming themes and subjects. <laughs> and, you know, if, if anyone can find a legal theme in why no one can make a good movie about a game, we would welcome that paper with open arms. But the irony is, did we really get respect? Did we really get the respect even after Atari versus Oban? We're art, but so what? went through the intellectual property problems of that, but there are other problems. And they occur in the realm of free speech, free expression, and we see them whenever there is a violent tragedy. Well, it's an old refrain. Blame it on the games, blame it on the gamer. So there's this refrain of blame without causality, often based on belief, not data. And it just looks like the prejudice and worse that the register of copyright had in Otari versus Oman. Still about being different, still about being a new technology, still pushed even though it's mainstream to the outside whenever something goes wrong. What's the answer? Is there an answer? When you look, at, oh please. Oh, sorry, no, no. I, <laughs> I have an answer, but um, I mean, it's Really, it's, I don't really think it's just like a lack of respect per se for like video games or whatever, but um, it's, you know, gun violence is something that no one really understands. So you know, the, the easiest parallel that we can find is virtual gun violence. So clearly people are going to point fingers at that, right? Right. But when you have a situation, uh, well, absolutely, and that's exactly what happens. And it's understandable in cultural terms. Something terrible happens. We see it over and over again. We become a blame culture. Who do you blame? And it's always easy to blame what you don't know and what you don't understand. And again, um, this is an uninformed statement, but I'm not sure that some of the pundits out there who blame things on games are gamers. Again, I have no evidence, so you can accuse me of being the pot calling the kettle black. That's fair. But the real issue, I alluded to this before um, in the, the, my first remarks about this class, is one of the lenses throughout the course is, is there a double standard here? You know, and Atari versus Oman was cool because the U.S. Court of Appeal said, no, oh, there's a double standard. It doesn't matter if it's Picasso 
or somebody in their basement creating something digital, you should apply a single standard, which makes perfect sense. But when we look at the violence issue and we look at what causes violence, do we have a double standard? If you are going to look at games, and you should, you need to, we need to look at everything in terms of causality. Do we need to look at high school football in Texas? Do we need to look at our OTC? Do we need to look at all sorts of other factors and do the same degree of academic study and measurement and search for causality and search for linkages? It may take us to some very uncomfortable places. I'm not saying it will, but we may find that there's a greater predisposition to violence among 15-year-olds who play junior hockey than 15-year-olds who play Halo. And if that turns out to be academically a sound finding, what do we do with that information? These are deep waters. And so apply the double standards test throughout and see where it takes you. Which brings us to the next class. And we are going to talk about expression and speech and their role And who are the real censors here? Are the censors the loud, punditry voices? Are they government? Or is there a layer of censorship built into the laws that apply to the video game world even before we get to those other voices? So there's one more thing I want to do in this class, but before we go there, um, any questions on the talk? Okay, moving forwards, the talks are going to be concise 45 minute pieces at the front end and there'll be something else happening in the back hour and the hope is that the back hour is going to be fully interactive but once we get the web log up, well the web log is up but once we start populating it um, you'll see how we get there. Which leads me directly to, and I'll try and post these as well, something that let's call news of the week. And I'm hoping that all of you will make this process an interactive one. All of these articles, if you wanted to know about them. They were somewhere on my Twitter account in the last couple of weeks. Um, but this is kind of the inaugural edition, so I'll give you a sense. Uh, going to do these all as short snappers, but react if you can, if you have a thought. The first is uh, just to cut myself down. Um, one of the themes we've talked about, I've mentioned several times, is double standards are bad apply a single standard. It's ethically and philosophically an important part of this course. Naturally, Stanley Fish, who writes for the New York Times on January 7th, just this weekend, wrote an article called Favoritism is Good. Double standards are good. He didn't address it directly at me, but he may as well have. Um, and he says, in essence, we're comfortable with double standards. It allows us to create communities of interest. That is a good thing. Um, anyone who says it isn't is all wet. I will confess that I have to reread this article to really understand the correctness of his point because I'm not getting it on an initial reading. 
But again, read it because it's a straight on attack to what I have suggested is one of the themes of the course. Um, NVIDIA is building a, its own gaming supercomputer grid. Um, just technological evolution that will allow cloud-based gaming. This will create all sorts of fascinating privacy and other issues because we are clearly moving away from localized gaming, we already have in many ways, to, uh, to cloud-based gaming. But they seem to be suggesting at the CES show that they've solved the problem. Apple rejects game based on Syrian civil war. So self-censorship, um, worth reading. This is an important one. Electronic Frontier Foundation put on their website a guide to the most important law protecting online speech. <coughs> well worth reading. It deals with uh, the 19, it deals with Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which provides that no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information. So if you're a carrier, you're safe. If you're not um, directly involved in the content speech, you're safe. And that's really important because you will see in video gaming and elsewhere, and certainly in more repressive regimes, that they'll go right to the publisher. And the publisher's freedom and the ISP's freedom, in fact, become our freedoms. So it's, a, it's just an interesting piece. Um, piece called the psychology of video uh, uh, on the psychology of video games called modifying player behavior in League of Legends with honor and it's a very interesting piece in terms of showing how you can use reward mechanisms and incentives within games to humanize the rhetoric, bring down the level of swearing and extracurricular violence that happens in lots of gaming communities. And, and um, it, it's, it's a bit of a Skinnerian approach, uh, but well worth thinking about. And well worth thinking about if someone's doing that to you within a game context, how do you feel about that? Does that feel like a breach of your privacy, your space, or you just, just reject it? I don't have to be part of this community. Um, interesting piece on game politics. Comic Book Legal Defense Fund takes aim at Senator Jay Rockefeller's video games research bill. So obviously what happened in New Jersey has raised a lot of political capital for looking more deeply at video games sponsored by various politicians. And uh, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund uh, just sort of got in there to remind people that video games aren't, this isn't new. This goes back to comics. This goes all the way back. There's always an emerging medium an emerging creative medium that involves kids that gets played. And if you look at your handy Martin's Criminal Code, I would invite you to look at the sections uh, on crime comics. Now gone, but well worth reading if you are going to direct your paper uh, towards censorship because there are enormous antecedents in the blame game to video games. Um, nice article on GamesBeat called Top Game Controversies of 2012. Uh, on the IP front, um, nice piece on opposable thumbs, examining Sony's internet free method for blocking used game sales. So Sony is now uh, going to embed their discs so that if you resell a game, 
it won't work on another system. You won't be able to resell your games. And they're not doing it through an authorization system that is in the cloud or on the net. They're building it right into the disk, right into the hard copies. And if you, as we go through the course, you will start seeing how that actually changes things. Because it's not a DRM, it's a physical limitation. Interesting approach to get around legal issues um, and right of first sale, which you'll hear a lot more about. I'll leave that one for the end. Um, I have to just raise this one. I don't know that it's a gaming issue. It's a comic issue, but I'll take it as related. Has anybody seen, um, and it is, a, it is a digital media issue, um, the amicus curiae brief that was filed uh, on the antitrust settlement, uh, the e-books antitrust settlement. Lawyer was limited to five pages for his brief, and he produced it in comic book form. And it is entirely brilliant. He lost miserably as you would expect. So it looks like every other uh, brief you would file. Here's your table of authorities. And then the argument is in comic book form. <laughs> if I could recommend one thing for you to read for this week, you got to read it. It's, it's awesome. It's truly terrifically well done. Um, not a big deal, but just so you know, depending on where you go with things, um, New York Times during December uh, published a bunch of papers, uh, articles on games where they had a playwright, they had a, a ballet, a, ba um, uh, a, a ballet expert um, in a section called Games Theory, uh, considering, uh, considering video games as ballet, a playwright on the art of video games. Um, all this means is that we're becoming mainstream, and people are trying to figure us out. Um, because it has to be mentioned before I get to the final piece. Um, in terms of New Jersey, two interesting pieces on the net. January 7th um, letter that cites all of the law. Not all of it, but does a very good piece of citing significant parts of the law, fair, more fairly stated, um, from the Entertainment Merchants Association to the Honorable Joseph Biden, Vice President of the United States, uh, re policy recommendations to address the school shootings in Newton, Connecticut. So if you are looking, I keep on calling it New Jersey, I mean Connecticut, um, if you are looking at a handy dandy four page synopsis, it's a good one. Related to that, um, a three part series from David Frum on the Daily Beast, I don't know if anybody saw it, called I Was Adam Lanza. And from um, someone who claims, and from claims to have done due diligence, um, had been in that horrible place, didn't do anything with it, but felt that uh, they could have, and what it looks like from the inside of a mind like that. Um, obviously, you have to take these things with a grain of th salt, but I will just quote briefly, how I acted had nothing to do with violent video games or m movies. If anything, they were cathartic especially the video games, which were a way to get the poison out of my system by attacking pixels instead of people. Take that for what it's worth. But it all does go to the question of when the National Rifle Association seems to suggest that virtual guns are more dangerous than physical guns. Really? But again, the world will decide for itself. Final piece. 
Anyone who can figure this one out, but I would love to hear it. Um, somehow, much of the course, certainly the part that's not related to intellectual property law, I can find somewhere in the entrails of this very short article. Father hires in-game hitmen to deter son from playing. <laughs> so a dad went out there, hired some video game players to stop his son from playing video games by killing him over and over and over again. <laughs> Now these are not just deep privacy waters, these are not deep legal waters, these are deep psychological waters. <laughs> but somehow I would suggest to you that everything but the intellectual property part of this course is somewhere in that article. Have a good week, see you next week.